John Shannon is the former executive producer of Hockey Night in Canada, the co-host of the Bob McCallum podcast, and he uh, he's a teacher as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sculpting the young exactly. broadcasters of tomorrow. Right. Broad and pod. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Folks, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Canucks in trouble, John. We sat here last week saying we're gonna do something, and then it was the old Seinfeld, a, a day about nothing. How surprised were you that we did not see the Vancouver Canucks feature at all on trade deadline day? Uh, I, I must admit, I was shocked. Um, I thought for sure that um, one winger would end up showing up in Vancouver. And, you know, we talked about Tyler Toffoli being that guy. I think it was kind of obvious that Jake Gensel wasn't going to be that guy. Uh, But whether it was a Jason Zucker or someone, I thought for sure there would be another player who could help with goal scoring, as if the Canucks need it, uh, that would show up in Vancouver. It, 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 It flummoxed me. Uh, for a couple of days to figure out why what happened. And then, of course, the other side of the story is, is, and what I don't think we'll ever really know, is how dissatisfied they were with Elias Lindholm and whether that, you know, actually created some conversation with the Boston Bruins uh, for Lindholm services and what would, in the end, the Canucks have gotten if they had done a deal with the Bruins. So it, and, well, it, it was, it was a surprise other than, and I mean, Jake DeBrusque was the obvious name, but, uh, to, and then in the end it was, it, it was kind of strange to think, but, but then you go back and you look at if they had done the Zadorov deal and the original Lindholm deal on trade deadline day, you would have said the Canucks won deadline day. So mm-hmm. it, it, that's, that's the thing you have to measure. Ironically, this chatter hasn't dragged Lindholm further into the muck. He's actually played some of the best hockey of his Canucks stay here in the last few. So um, if there were hurt feelings, he's doing a darn good job of suppressing them. Yeah, I, I, I do think, though, and, I, you know, look at what the Jets did on Saturday night at, at Rogers Arena. I, I mm-hmm. do think that there's, there's an emotional letdown, an emotional change after deadline time, or there's some exuberance that, hey, I'm still here. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and every manager in the league looks at all of this stuff and weighs and, and measures it, uh, or even better measures and weighs it, um, to, to think how, how long will it take for a player to fit in? Um, and perhaps despite that, you know, that first two goal outbreak that they had, um, you know, the Canucks and Lindholm took a long, lot longer to, to get to know each other. And perhaps it's, it's, a, it's a time to be patient with what's going on, particularly now without Thatcher Demko for a while, um, to know what the Canucks are going to be as they prepare for the playoffs. So you think there's putting the, this genie back in the bottle? You wouldn't worry about Lindholm's attitude or commitment or confidence level after all that? The only thing I would say is uh, at this point, you know, I, I do think they have a better sense of whether he's in Vancouver long term or he's quite simply a rental. And then you have to deal with that. But right now, your focus is to get through until the 22nd of April to start the playoffs and go from there. And then, you know, the chips fall where they may after that. Did, well, did you, um, I'm not sure how much of Alvin you heard on Friday, given that it was a press conference about nothing, but, you know, he basically said, um, Dollar in, dollar out for us. Uh, it was right. a cap matter, and also that they had a narrow list of of trade targets that they thought could help. Yeah, did, I, did you I, buy I that, actually, or I, I actually thought he was pretty transparent. I thought he was pretty open and honest. It was you're right. It was when you don't do anything, you have to. I'm not sure you you can't sit there and say, well, we were after this guy and we were after that guy. But I, I thought I thought Patrick handled it pretty well under the circumstances, uh, just trying to you know set everybody straight on what the philosophy going into Friday was, and and I, I don't think we can sit here ever and criticize the Vancouver Canucks for not being willing to make a trade, uh, considering that if prior to Friday. I think there were 19 trades, and the Canucks were involved in 40 percent of them. So, 
over the year. So it's one of those things where we, we create an expectation for Friday, nothing happens and we're let down. And I don't think that's fair when it comes to the Vancouver Canucks. Man, I take my daughters down to the outlet mall all the time. And like, I go in a bunch of stores. I look at a bunch of things, but usually I don't buy them. You know, so I'm I'm involved. I'm look. I'm I'm you know. I'm By the way, Blake, I want to go to the outlet. I want to go to the outlet mall with you rather than my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Is the family budget capped out as well? I just you know, I'm not desperate for anything. It's gonna have to jump into my lap for me to for me to actually want to buy it. So, uh, but that's it. That, those are all the storylines for the Canucks. So we'll close down the uh, the hit for today. Thanks uh, for joining us, John. There's nothing else to talk about here. Oh, maybe we should talk to him about that. Your demo. Mm-hmm. How do you think they'll do without Demko? How much faith do you have in Casey DeSmith? Um, well, you, you know, it, well, it's going to be a pause says it all. Yeah, that exactly. pause says I, it I, all, Shannon. Sure it does. Sure it does. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, uh, you, you, if you want the cup half full, answer is, thank goodness they have a quality backup. If you want the cup half empty, Oh my God, the Oilers are only 10 points behind with three games in hand. You, you know, the first place is not a lock. And that the, and that's gonna be the real challenge is to there's gonna be a lot more onus on the defense to be better than it has been in the last six weeks. Uh, and you know, and you know as well as I do, Rick talk will be talking about process and discipline. A heck of a lot more, and there's going to have to be a lot more contributions from the forwards to help out Casey DeSmith as well. Do you uh, do you think that this team has found its defensive posture though at the right time? I mean, it, it, I think we would have worried about this goaltending uh, trouble here, you know, f- uh, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, even. But um, there's been a bunch of one goal against games and, and a shutout here in the last four games. Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly feel more comfortable uh, about it, Blake. I, I really do. But it, to me, it does go back to the fact that it's a quality backup. You know, there was, mm-hmm. you know, what, I think he's played 19 games. Uh, his save percentage is around 900. Uh, he, he's done exactly what he's supposed to do. Now, can he react to the, the pressure of being a number one? There was a time in Pittsburgh that, you know, that they gave him the number one job uh, in the short term and, and, and it worked out all right. It didn't work out great. It worked out all right. Uh, so from that perspective, I think you have to, let, let me put it this way, not to change the direction. I feel better with Casey DeSmith than I would have with Spencer Martin. Well, you know, yeah. I, I, I do. Uh, and I, and I think that you have to give them credit for being aware of, the trials and tribulations of Demko's injuries last year and saying we can't go into a season like this without quality backup. And that's who they found from Montreal before the season started. Points in 13 of the 17 starts. I think it, you know, it, it's all right there. He, he, any coach would take that from his backup goaltender, that ratio at the start of a season. right? And, and they have a better sense of how severe the Demko injury is. And, you know, I can only laugh at, a few people who were worried that Demko was being overworked. Well, I'll tell you what, if he comes back healthy, now he's rested. And and so rested for the playoffs, which is what you need. You, you need him, in my opinion, you need Demko to come back and play three of the last five games of the regular season so that he's in game form again, and then have your number one goalie ready for the playoffs when they start in mid-April. Philip Ronick is now the big RFA with Elias Pettersson signed. Uh, Patrick Alvin allowed last week that they have made a contract offer to Philip Ronick. Boy, he's got a lot of leverage here as a, an RFA because he's really been the linchpin to this Canucks season. I mean, he's been the most significant addition over last year and has really keyed that defense and partnered well with Quinn Hughes. Um, what do you think? How urgent is this file for the Canucks? And, and do you think Ronick's an $8 million guy? going forward. Well, I know his agent, Alan Walsh thinks he's an $8 million guy. Um, you know, and, I, and he, and he, let's face it. He has, if not the most vigilant, one of the most vigilant agents in the hockey world to represent it. We also know that, you know, prior to Christmas, 
Um, there were some off the record discussions between the Canucks and Walsh about Ronick's contract. Um, so from, from that perspective, I fully expect that there will be some level of not compromise, but understanding of what Ronick means. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think term will be the issue for this guy. I mean, he's young enough now that they can deal with him uh, on a long-term deal. Um, but when you have Miller under contract, you have Pedersen under contract, who knows what you're doing with Lindholm Quinn, you know, you do, you, you, you do a long-term deal for big money with Ronick. How does that domino effect, uh, start the discussion with Quinn Hughes when his contract comes up in three years? I think it's three years. Yeah. Two, um, well, so, well, what's so, what's, what's, the, what per, what's pushing the downward pressure more on this Ronick number, do you think? Is the fact that Quinn Hughes makes 7.8 and you can't go past Quinn Hughes? Or is it the fact that Elias Pettersson uh, probably should have got something with a 12 in front of it and instead took something with an 11 in front of it? Or do you think both of those factors will weigh into the offer and ultimately what Ronick takes? Well, let me ask you this, because uh, uh, I had a discussion uh, with somebody else about another player and another team. Uh, do you think that Philip Ronick can make more money than Quinn Hughes? On another team? Like if he went oh, to free right now, on the, on the Vancouver Canucks, can Philip Ronick ever make more money than Quinn Hughes? I, I think it's a very tough sell yeah. with Quinn Hughes. I think you could creep him to $8 million and explain salary cap jump and all the things that Inflation salary jump disappeared when you signed Pedersen. <laughs> no, but you know that there's more uh, available space going forward, and that um, you know what it's been three years since you signed his contract, and there's an inflationary effect on players over that period of time. I, I think you can sell it. I think it's a difficult sell. It'd be great if the number came in right at Hughes. I think that's probably fair. I think that, and I, you know, the one thing I will say about, um, and I know Jim better than I know Patrick, is that they, they, they are logical, they have common sense, uh, and, and there's a sincerity when they deal with these guys that they buy in. I mean, in case in point, the Pearson deal got done after a quiet, private meeting between Elvin Rutherford and Pedersen to say, here's where we're going. Here's our thinking process. Here's what you need to do. And I suspect that those discussions have occurred, at least with Alan, uh, over the Ronick situation. So mm -hmm. I, I think seven, eight, if you told me seven, eight for max eight years for Ronick, I would say sign the deal now and let's get on and worry about somebody else. Yep. Um, are you disappointed Kil Phil Kessel isn't going to be in a Canucks uni this year, John? Well, I tell you what, uh, he, he does have a winning, winning pedigree, Matt. Um, but let's face it, I mean, it, was, it was a long shot at best. Uh, and when you did see him on the ice in Abbotsford, you did wonder if there was any chance in the short term that he could get into any type of playing shape um, to help the, help the hockey club. You know? you know, God bless him for trying and uh, give the Canucks kudos for giving him a chance. But... Also, you have to be pragmatic. This is this is a tough business at time, and um, and the Canucks, I thought, saw the writing on the wall when he was in Abbotsford and made the right decision. Um, you cover the Oilers. You're one of their uh, intermission panelists during regional telecasts. Uh, they also were the show about nothing on Friday, but they did an awful lot just prior to. Enrique, Carrick, Troy, Stetcher, how much do they improve Edmonton? How worried would you be if you're the Canucks sitting where you are watching the Oilers with all these games in hands and, and uh, coming off a weekend where they swept Buffalo and Pittsburgh? Oh, they didn't sweep Buffalo. They lost in Buffalo. Um, you know, they did get a point there. Um, you know, the, it's going to take some time. You know, they did not get faster when they got particularly Carrick and Henrique. Uh, Troy Stetcher is qu quite simply there for insurance. I mean, in, in, in an ideal world in Edmonton, Troy Stetcher never plays. That's not a knock at Stetcher, but they live with the six defensemen that they have right now. Uh, he's a, he, he quite frankly is, is an insurance policy. Uh, Adam Henrique is going to help them at, at a certain point. The face-off circle, 
when games get tighter in the playoffs. Um, but the question becomes is foot speed for him. Uh, and does that allow them to try to find a way? And by the because you should add Corey Perry to that list of guys they acquired too, if we're talking about, you know, Lindholm and, and, and Zadorov for the Canucks. Corey Perry's addition has, has helped Edmonton as well. But if, if they can find a way to take what Henrik's strengths are and grind a little bit more in the playoffs, uh, then the teams in the Pacific have to be a little bit concerned. Uh, and I think that a lot of people have been distracted in the Pacific with what Vegas did rather than worry about what Edmonton did. Is the Western Conference playoff picture done? Uh, the Wild pulling the goalie in OT last night to just get one extra point. Uh, they played tonight. Flames are hosting the Avs. You think the Flames are in the same thing? They've lost a couple in a row now. And then the Golden Knights versus the Kraken might be the most delicious because the Kraken win, um, the door is open a Kraken, if you will, uh, chasing down the Golden Knights. Well, here's, here's the, the thing about, just to go back to the Minnesota scenario with pulling the goalie. If that had been a team they weren't chasing, I suspect they wouldn't have pulled the goalie. But the fact that it was Nashville and the fact that it's Nashville was the target in the Western Conference wildcard, that really did mitigate what John Heinz was doing. That, was, that made it that much more important for them uh, to be all in on, on that rule change. By the way, did you both of you know the rule? Yep. Yeah. Good. Good. I can't believe people had forgotten. Well, can you believe that Matthew Boldy no. himself didn't know? Like, if the yeah, players did, he was, was he born when the rule was made? But John, <laughs> it's so important for the players to know that because they have to play with a defensive conscious in that point. If you don't, if you send the players over the board and they don't know that, they might be a little more frivolous with the puck than they would otherwise no. be, or or or, or more nervous. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, it, just as a reminder that the great Roger Nielsen, who had such an impact in Vancouver and lots of other places, Roger Nielsen would make his kids in junior hockey, they would give them a rules test at the beginning of every season mm. so that they understood the rules of the game. I think we should probably get back to having coaches give their players, at least in training camp, a rules so you understand the rules. So, hey, you don't bitch at the referee too much. Uh, but you understand in those scenarios, that is actually quite a factor. We, we had an argument, just as a total aside, in Edmonton was in Pittsburgh on s Sunday afternoon, and uh, uh, Stuart Skinner played a minute 16, did not have a shot on goal uh, when, when he replaced uh, Calvin Pickard for that end of the second period. And we had an argument. Well, he didn't face a shot on goal, so Pickard has to get the shot out. Doesn't work that way. The moment the second goalie goes in for 10 seconds, it becomes a shared shutout. So Pickard right. doesn't get that one beside his shutout. It mm. just becomes a team shutout. The rules rules are there to are, are good for us hockey nerds to understand. We, um, um, we have I, I got to tell, tell you, the West is going to be crazy. And I don't think it's settled. And all you do is you need a team to go on a six-game heater, and all of a sudden people are going to be on the edge of their seat. We had a shared team shut out here on Saturday, third in Canucks history. You know what we need, John? Hockey needs an official score like baseball to award the shutout in such circumstances. No, because then the players will sulk at the official score. That's true. Just like, just like has happened in baseball. And, and official scores become in baseball because so meek and mild about what an error is and what, so error, what true. it is. So be true. Because they may not get an interview with the guy after the game. John, there was legitimately a red phone in the Blue Jays press box at Skydome when I covered the team. And when that thing ran, the hush fell over the press box because everybody knew that was a player, manager, coach calling up from one of the dugouts questioning the official score. So I, think you should, I think you should whatever. retract that request, uh, Matt. I think you should retract that. <laughs> Keep coaching them up there in school, John. Thanks for this, and we'll catch up next week. Cheers, boys. Hey, everybody. If you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Secure Some Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.